up to anyway so doing the whole like um, okay. pandemic and the lovely 2020 that we're having yeah so to be honest last couple of years with my injuries and stuff I had like quite a bit of surgery in that so yeah my life naturally calmed down a bit okay. and then um obviously lockdown happened and I've, I've not been I had surgery just before lockdown so yeah. I was like bed bound anyway and I've just got myself back on my feet really last couple of months but yeah. um, my life's pretty chilled anyway because um I left, I was making a discharge from the Royal Marines and then um, set up a business and then had a, a restaurant at one point and lots of different bits and bobs. And wow, yeah, I just make lots of money from different ways and I do sometimes do public speaking and things like that. So I've never had a nine to five up until obviously when I left. So um, yeah, life's been all right for me. I'm luckily I'm able to stay home with the kids and chill out. Um, and if I do do something, I can just do it on Zoom. So yeah, fair enough. It means I'm a lot actually things. struggling to... Obviously, it's, it's mentally, it's a bit annoying. It is boring. Yeah. Um, I do miss going out and about. It'd be nice to sit there face to face, obviously, but yeah. um, I can still do things. So I'm quite lucky in that sense. Mm. Home to me doesn't mean everything stops. Yeah. How does it feel for someone that's been like so active throughout the years? I mean, going from the army to running marathons to now being like stuck indoors and that. Yeah, it's. I'm quite good at adapting quite quick, to be honest. Mm. Um, I suppose you have to. I've, I've done the whole kind of, like, I mean, after all this happened to me. And I was in um, where was I? I was in Birmingham, Selwyn Hospital. Yeah. And I was there for about five or six weeks. And at one point, I did the whole kind of just sit there and look out the window and just be depressed. Yeah. And it really didn't get me anywhere. So now, if things change and things get a bit not to my liking, I just somehow find a way to move forward. I don't take the positives out of everything because it's almost impossible. But yeah, definitely. I do. I do look at you know what I can do opposed to what I can't do. And during lockdown, there's a lot of things that I can do. So I've done a lot of things, the typical housework and emptying out the garage and all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> yeah. then found out new activities as well and tried to entertain myself in different ways. So yeah, I think the thing is life goes, everyone's getting a bit too, you no, know, it's all over, we're stuck in, but life goes on and you know, once we're back out, we'll find another way to get through it. Yeah, so. I, guess, I guess it's all about adapting as well because I'm, I'm having to adapt a lot as well in regards to like some of the work that I do and having to now record it in Zoom as I just mentioned as well. It's, it's a different form of like, communication and human contact but at the same time I feel like I'm able to now contact like get in touch with people from further away than I used to yeah but before it's very heavily concentrated in London I was having discussions with yeah. business personnel and and psychiatrists and stuff all based in London but now yeah. I feel like because I'm on zoom now there's nothing stopping me from contacting someone over in yeah the exactly yeah I'm not really further away so it's, it's completely changed the spectrum of things but yeah it's also aided it in a way so it's not all bad news is it yeah that's the thing I mean and now obviously like the disease itself is obviously horrendous but at the same time it's opened lots of new I suppose there was going to be some kind of change in how we we live our lives and yeah. I think this has kick-started it yeah. it's the whole kind of internet thing obviously it's always been around but yeah. the whole like when, once lockdown's over we'll still be using zoom we'll still be social distancing yeah you know you still won't be sat that close behind someone at a bar would you, you know yeah, everyone's going to no. change now forever so you're going to be wary now you're not just going to have to be drunk yeah. hugging people all around in the bar yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, when you think about it, it was actually quite minging how we lived before. Yeah, it was crazy. You know, when it shops and like going to parks and restaurants and crap on the tables and yeah. jumping <laughs> cars and just like, when you actually think about it, it's like, bloody hell, well, I'm surprised it died from a disease from 10 years ago. But, <laughs> you know, like now I think it's changed. It's just any any change takes time. And obviously, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I never used to like ordering things online on my phone at first or on the internet because yeah. I didn't trust it. What if it comes in wrong sides, it rolls my bank account. You like to try it, yeah. And, and now I've done it. I always do it. I say with contactless. I always on the top of my PIN number still. And then now I'm just mm -hmm. beep, beep, beep. You know, everyone just kind of adapts. So I think, yeah, I think once, you know, give it another two years. Yeah. Um, we will look back and think that was bad, but we'll be living a much better life, I think, in the future. Most definitely. Um, cleaner anyway, safer. Yeah, most definitely. How long have you been out of the army now since your incident? How many years ago was it? Um, I think I left about 2012, 13. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think. Yeah. It's weird because at the time, um, like I'd just been injured in intensive care. Then I was in a burns and plastics unit on my own, just a room. Then I was at Heddy Court, got my walking leg 
ran a marathon, yeah. finished that, and then I was medically discharged, and then I was a civilian kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah. I only had a chance to actually think about what had happened after I'd left. And I suppose that's where some people with the mental health, that side kicks in, because yeah, yeah. you're just going with the flow, so to speak, because mm. you have no other option. It's only when you have more than five minutes to sit down to yourself, yeah. you think, bloody hell, I've... I just had to do this, this, and it. So there's some things that I've actually forgotten that I've done. Um, mm. So when somebody else says something, I found a couple of pictures a couple of days ago in the garage, and I thought, bloody hell, I completely forgot about this, this, and this, because at the time, you just keep moving forward. Then I've, now I've got kids, and then you're obviously just moving forward again. So yeah, only when I really think about what's gone on do I think about it. So I'm not even sure if it's 2013. It might not be, but I think oh. it's around 11 to 13. Yeah, years ago. Congratulations on the, on the newborn, actually, by the way. Yeah, thank you, yeah. How many yeah, kids have you got Two. I've got one who's three um, and one who's three weeks yeah. or four weeks, I think. Oh, amazing. For, for those that don't know, can you um, sort of take us back to the, the day of the incident where you lost both your limbs? Because I'm sure a lot of people are watching right now and they, they can see that you, you've got um, one limb covered up. So you're, you're a double amputee, aren't you? Yeah. So, yeah, I was in the Royal Marines and I went out to... Af when, when I joined up, you know, if you join the military, not for everyone, obviously, but mm. if you join up, especially like the Royal Marines where you're on the front line, I really wanted to go out there and fight. So I didn't want to join up and then like, um, just stay here in the UK. And then 20 years later, yeah. I've just lived my whole life just in the forces, but never done anything, you know? Yeah. So as weird as it sounds, I actually wanted to go to war. Um, oh, yeah. So when I when I joined up, um, yeah, we got sent out there to fight. Yeah. And um, yeah, this one day, things were getting quite kind of iffy anyway. Yeah. And whether you like it or not, you, you, your body kind of, at some point says, hang on a minute, this isn't right. And I, I woke up this one day and um, it's 20th February and I didn't have a dream or anything like that, but my mind just said like clear, my own voice just said, yeah. today you're gonna get killed or really badly injured. Serious? And I was like, bloody hell, because I had no dream or nothing. If you, well, we were about a mission the day before or something. They're, they're, they're yeah, so yeah, we always have yeah. an idea of what we're doing. Well, we know exactly what we're doing the next yeah. day. And then normally you kind of, you go to sleep if you can sleep and then you kind of go out on patrol the next not the day in during the night basically early hours of the morning so you already know what we're going to be doing so you then got the night to kind of yeah. think about it and whatever sort your kit out get all your weapons together and everything um so yeah that i, I knew what was coming the next day <clears throat> like we always did and i just woke up that morning dark must be like two three in the morning and um yeah i just i didn't know officially but mine said this is it but I couldn't obviously then say to my, my boss, I don't want to go on patrol, please, because I've had a <laughs> yeah. bad dream or something. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so if I, you can I just there, go with it. There's one interesting thing. So when it comes to the army, for instance, when I think about the army and people out there on the, on the battleground, I always think, are they, do they wake up like thinking, no, nah, do you know what? I'm not on it, you know? Like, I might get hit with a bullet <laughs> today. And, and if you do, oh, how, yeah. how do you go about getting that out of your mind? Because you can't tell your, your, your compatriots or you can't really tell your boss being like, yeah. Yo, I'm shooting well, it out to the field today. Well, that's it. I mean, we're only human, so mm. we'll have the same thought process as everyone else. Um, some days you wake up buzzing and some days you just mm. like just don't feel it, you know, and you don't know why. So no, you can do, you have to just go out there. Mm. Um, there's no way that you could, unless you were literally sick, then you, you know, you'd be a liability because you haven't got the strength to carry on kind of thing. So you, you'd stay back. But other than that, you just have to go out there. So, and I wasn't ever going to pretend I was sick to, to stay back kind of thing. Yeah. So... Yeah, even though I didn't feel great mentally about it, I just went out there. Um, even when I was putting my kit on, like my, my Bergen, my big rucksack with ammunition and whatever, and it was like, felt really heavy that day. Mm. Same weight, same bag, but just felt heavy. Um, my helmet didn't fit right for, for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. And all these different things were just adding up. And I was just like, but nothing, it could have all worked out and nothing would have happened. And I thought, bloody hell, like that was nothing, you know? Mm. So, do I risk going out or do I fake it and stay back? Obviously, I'm going to go out there. So I just went out on patrol. And within a couple of hours, um, we were running across to some compound and a bomb went off, basically. Yeah. And when I woke up on the floor, my right leg was gone. So I had just my bone stick, my whole shin bone was sticking out with no foot on the end. Um, my left arm was in bits. My knee was blown out. Groin was blown was out. Was it mine or was it some bomb that was launched at you? No, it was in mine. Okay. So it's just something that you can trigger. So there was three of us. So three of us got injured in the end. So I lost my, my arm and leg. And one guy hurt his back. One guy had all his face ripped open and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, we all survived. But yeah, I was just kind of lying there, bleeding to death, really. And then obviously, can't go into it too, too much, but 
yeah. had to kind of um, try and figure out mentally, first of all, if I even wanted to survive it, because I just didn't know how I was going to get through it anyway. The pain was horrendous, as you can imagine. When I tried to like move a little bit, my bone dragged across the floor. Yeah. And I was in agony, and he got blood everywhere. There's flies coming everywhere. Um, and yeah, I just haven't got a lot of strength. So the bit of strength that I did have, I had to use wisely. And even then, it was difficult to use any kind of strength, to be honest. So you're trying to sort yourself out, but you can't. You're a bit scared, but you're not. You're trying to survive, but you can hear noises, but you're not sure if it's Taliban or if it's your friends or whatever. Dust everywhere, noises, flies everywhere. My gun was gone. Um, could barely breathe. And obviously, I've got my limbs hanging off kind of thing. So, yeah, a lot to go through. But um, luckily, I didn't pass out. So I remember everything that happened. Some guys just get blown up and they wake up in the UK. And I've got no legs. Wouldn't that be the better option to just completely wake up in the hospital? Or did, did I, don't, I don't think so. Um, it's because better to go through the agony and, and feel yeah, the whole because, process. Yeah, I mean, if, if you just blinked and then you had no legs, and then you got yeah. someone saying, "Oh, I think what happened was you did this," and someone else says that happened, like you want to know what happened yourself. So, what gives me that peace of mind is I know what happened. I know how I reacted. Mm. I understand the pain that I've gone through mentally, physically, emotionally. So, it helps me now in the future because obviously, if I go through things now. I know that it's never as bad as that. Yeah. So I can always kind of relate things. So it's kind of made me stronger now to get over um, hurdles that I face now mm. because I know this, you can't go any deeper than what I experienced then because the next step was death. <laughs> so um, the next option was obviously I die and I was just above that. So unless I find myself in the trenches again, one, I know I can crawl out of it because I already have. Mm. And two, if I never go that deep, I know I'm obviously stronger to beat it. So... Yeah, I'm kind of glad that I've kind of experienced it. I wish I didn't got blown up, but I'm glad I didn't pass out. Yeah. Um, because now I know what happened myself. Um, and then yeah, I can just use that time to move forward. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, I got blown up and then got rescued after a while. And they took me back to a hospital camp bastion in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They saved my life there. And then I got flown back to I got put to sleep in Afghanistan and they flew me back back to the UK and I woke up in Birmingham. Oh wow. How long was the healing process for you, though? Um, probably about six, seven weeks because yeah. they just chopped the bone off out of my leg. So I lost my leg. They chopped my arm off. Mm -hmm. But within about seven or eight weeks, I was walking again. So oh, wow. even though I wasn't healed, yeah. I was still obviously able to get around. I was fully dressed and everything like that. I could have a conversation. So mm -hmm. mentally, I had no damage apart from any issues that come in the future. Yeah. Um, so I was able just to... Um, get on with life I could have conversations and get out and about and get fresh air and walk around and stuff like that I always had the marathon coming up in a year yeah. so yeah I just had got back in the zone and just kept on moving forward and um, when I read about these type of stories um, in regards to like um, army personnel and losing limbs there's always the talk about like the, the sort of like suffering from um, I think where, where's it called phantom pain it's the, no, oh, phantom oh, pain. that as well yeah we're gonna we're gonna get into that as well yeah but but phantom pain so yeah, phantom when, pain. when you when you woke up from the first surgery, what was that feeling like? Did you suffer from phantom pain? And can you explain what phantom pain uh, is? Yeah, so phantom pain, it's just, it's your nerves, basically. So the nerves that were controlling my, my hands and my feet or whatever, I still have those nerves. They've just been chopped up higher because obviously the limbs are not there. Yeah. So they still fire, which means I can still feel my limbs that aren't actually there. So it's still sending signals so to your thumbs and your... your yeah, your so you still have... I mean, if you lose your arm, mm. your nerves go away through your arm. Yeah. So you don't chop the nerve out from here. It's just it's been chopped off from where you've lost your arm, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So I still have nerves being sent to no destination, if you know what I mean. So um, you have phantom limb sensation where you can just feel your limbs. Then you have the pain where it actually hurts. Yeah. Um, at the start, I didn't really feel it because I was in so much pain anyway. I didn't know what pain was what. I was just in agony the whole time. So it was only after a couple of years when it died down. Not only could I feel my fingers, but I could actually move them and I could feel which ones hurt and stuff like that. Mm. My foot hurts quite a lot. I get like sharp stabbing pains. You can take uh, medication for it, but it's like a muscle relaxer and some like gabapentin as well. And it just almost makes you like, some of it's like an antidepressant. Yeah. And I'm not really depressed. So yeah. you're in this zone of a bit like that, but it gets rid of the phantom pain. But I can't afford to be like zoned out because I've got kids and yeah. Yeah, I've got absolutely. things I want to do during the day. So I need to be like, straight if you know what I mean so mm. I've never really taken any medication for it I've tried to in the past but I've just stopped and I just deal with whatever it is I'm going through but it is a bit of a nightmare because it can just make you jump and officially there's not a lot you can do you can take you can take any meds for anything but officially you can't get rid of 
whatever it is you're going through. It's just it's just you, isn't it? Continue, so, so, so it's going to be a continuous sensation, in essence. Yeah. Not something that's just going to stop. Yeah, I spoke to a guy years ago, and he was like, I had it for 25 years. <laughs> so oh, wow. um, it's just, I mean, when you get blown up by a bomb or you go for some kind of traumatic experience, you're never going to recover 100%. Mm. So you have to accept and fact, it's almost like calculated risk, I have to factor into my life that I will experience pain. I will experience on the mental side of things. I'll feel down a bit sometimes. I can't just expect to go back to where I was in every way, shape, or form. I can't. So even though the pain's a bit of a pain in the ass, <clears throat> I've accepted that that's a part of my life now. I will live with phantom pain and so on. Yeah. And what about the mental side of things? Like, how did you deal with that in the PSD that <clears throat> yeah, men- followed? Yeah, mentally, it was all right. At the, at the start, it was fine. I've got so many different things going on. Mm. I didn't have time to think about how I really... The thing is, it's like, for example, let's say you've gone on patrol. Mm. Someone's shooting at you. The bullet's just gone over your head. A bomb's gone off. Someone's been shot or whatever. You go through it all, but it's only like a couple of days later when you've had more than five minutes to think about it. You think, bloody hell, that bullet went right past my head. It could have like blown my head off. So you experience everything, but you process it at a later date. So for me, I went through what I went through. And at first, at the start, I was fine. But after, over the years, now my mind's more relaxed and my body's more relaxed and I'm kind of feeling a bit normal now. Now my mind might say, oh, let's think about the time where, you know, after your leg was blown off, you could smell burning flesh and blah, blah, blah. So either week I was in the kitchen doing dishes and I just had this woof of like burning flesh mm. um, just come back to me for the first time in like 13 years. Um, and then you're like, bloody hell, because then it like shocks you a bit and then you tr- yeah. it brings back the memories and things like that. So that's kind of what I'm going through at the minute. Um, only probably like three, four years ago, I felt like jumping out a window at one point just because yeah. it was just too much of this memory going on, which stopped me from just living my normal life because I couldn't think about the weather because I was busy thinking about my leg that got blown off and a piece of meat that was looked like a bit of steak, but it was part of my leg sat over there and flies were on it. And I remember looking at it and all that, you know, when you think about things like that on a daily basis, all day, every day, you don't hear your missus speaking to you or you can't taste your food and you don't notice it's a lovely day outside because you just think of the thing. So it just got a bit too much at one point, but that's really the lowest I've ever been. Yeah. And again, I just didn't take any meds for it. I just yeah. thought I'm feeling bad, but it won't, hopefully it won't last. I'll just kind of hopefully grow out of it. And I did. And now I can see I have good days again, some bad days, but mostly good days. Do you think the follow-up sort of like care and help and, and support was adequate in order to get you out of that state? Yeah, I mean, the, there is, the thing is, back then when I was injured, for example, it's like, it was a new thing. Yeah. We obviously went to war and just thought we'd just beat them all up and then leave kind of thing. And then obviously everyone was getting injured and killed and so on. And then like 10 years later, we're still there fighting. So no one expected, I mean, even like the rehab facilities, they were great, but they didn't have all the stuff they needed because they didn't expect, normally if you get your arm and leg burned off, you just die. Yeah. But with technology and hospitals and things like that, with survived injuries that years ago, you would have just died on the spot. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's things there in place, but not necessarily up to scratch. Yeah. So yeah, mental health side of things, no one even really spoke about it 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Men shouldn't really come out of it kind of thing, you know, have a beer and get on with it, you know, yeah. that <laughs> kind of attitude. So there was nothing around anyway like that. Only recently... Now people are really kind of saying, be who you are and don't be ashamed kind of thing. You can really talk about it openly, um, including myself, really. So there are things out there now, probably, I, I wouldn't need it to go and speak to anybody. But back then when I maybe was feeling a bit down, mm. whether it was there or not, I don't really know, because obviously I didn't go for that process. But I'm sure now everything's available. Most definitely. Um, yeah. T- times, times have really changed in regards to like men expressing themselves and discussing mental health issues because it was always a thing that we just used to brush off. And I had a, and I had a great conversation with one of my friends yesterday who I hadn't spoken to for ages. We, we spoke on the phone for about two hours and um, it started off really jovial. Everyone was just like, yo, what's been going on since the lockdown, bro? I've been doing this, I've been doing that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the conversation just went boom. <laughs> like everyone just, we, we all kind of just, let loose in regards to like how we've been struggling with like I mean losses yeah. of jobs, losses of family members during this period, and and losses of loved ones and plans that never came into fruition. But mm. I feel like people being more outspoken now is enabling other people to speak up about how they feel mentally. 
and how yeah. they feel psychologically within society. And it's, it's a great tool because if not, then people suffer in silence. And when people suffer in silence, we know where that can eventually lead to. That's that's why we have ridiculous like suicide rates amongst men. So it's, it's a vital part of like our, our functioning um, um, mind and everything for us to be able to discuss what it is that's happening and what it is that we're going through so we can seek the adequate help and support that we need. So that's yeah, that's I mean, that's the thing. It's like we've always been able to talk freely about our mental health as men, I think. But for some reason, donkeys years ago, somebody must have said men can't talk about this stuff, but maybe women can. Mm. And then we almost agreed a secret handshake and we've been living like that for, for yeah. years. And only now we're trying to fight back against something we didn't even ask for. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> it's just it's weird how we're kind of having to come come out and say we want to talk like. Of course we can, we're only human. Mm. But that's the thing with this world, there's all these different rules and regulations that some idiots made up a thousand years ago and we're, we're still trying to live by them today and now we're having to break them all down. And it's just, it's crazy. But I mean, even that being said myself, you know, when my son fell over a couple of days ago, you know, get up, you're a boy kind of thing, you'll be all right. And I think actually, if he's hurt, then he's going to cry. Do you know what I mean? But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's almost like yeah. wired into you without even realising yeah. um, when it's wrong. But that's the thing with society. We get someone at the top says something, it filters down, yeah. and then we all think that's how we got to live. And if someone tries to be different, then it's an issue. Mm. So then, you know, but yeah, I think it's good now that everyone just being honest with themselves and just saying, speak freely, be who you want to be kind of thing yeah. is a good thing. It's just the government seems to try and make you believe that it's a bad thing if you kind of step out. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, that's the thing. It's not soft at all to like speak out, um, it's just how you feel. Most yeah. definitely. And, and I think education has been an essential part of it as well now. And education mixed with like technology and, and social media and us being able to connect with each other on a more wider basis. It's like we're able to share more. Whilst before, mm -hmm. maybe the information wasn't there. So you're always in your little bubble. So if you're struggling, yeah. the boys will be like, yo, man, let's go out for a drink, man. You'll be all right in a sec. Like a couple of shots and you're good to yeah, go. Yeah. But then later <laughs> on, when you leave that boy and he goes back home, He's, he's in his yeah. room and he's, he's in a dark place, like yeah. completely destroyed and broken. So that's been an essential part. But wh when you talk about societal barriers, there's there's one of the questions I wanted to ask you was in regards to like, um, why the army for you? Because, okay, um, whenever I have discussions amongst like some of like, my ethnic friends in regards to the, the army and joining the British army in particular, there, there is a sort of, um, there's a sort of pushback, like feeling, feeling disconnected to, to the nation that you're a part of in essence the nation that you're holding their passport, the nation that you're, you're making your living in, that you have your family in, but it's also a disconnect yeah. to join the, the armed forces. It's like, why yeah. am I going to go and die for a country that you in essence yeah. live in? <laughs> Do you see what I mean? But yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. So obviously, you, you being a black man, like, why the army? And also, why do you think there's a disconnect? And how can we sort of, like, bridge that? Yeah, well... Um... It's a bit like if you play for a football team in England, let's say, yeah, you wouldn't turn down a cap because, yeah, but the country's racist or whatever you think. Like, you're playing for the lads on the pitch kind of thing. Like, yeah. by then, they, they're your best buddies, if you know what I mean. Mm. So, it's kind of like that. Like, when I joined the Royal Marines, yeah, I want to fight for my country, but I'm not Mr. Patriotic. I didn't go there with a tear running down my face. Oh, I want to fight for this country because we're in a war kind of thing. I went there, oh, it's a job as well, bear in mind, it's a job, I get paid, you know, I'd left school kind of thing, what am I gonna do? So mm. I wanted to join the Marines from years ago anyway, but I joined the Royal Marines, it's a legit job. Mm. Um, you get paid, you get to travel the world and all this kind of stuff, and obviously you go away and you fight. So when I went through training, it wasn't really about black and white and all this, it was 60 odd of us stood there, we all wanna be the same thing. Mm. And when you're being told to do a thousand press ups, jump in that pool of water, crawl across the ground for 10 million miles, everyone's just trying to do it. So you weren't thinking about fighting for your country or the queen or anything like that. Mm. You're just doing what you're being told to do, so to speak. By the time you finished training, only 11 originals got through out of about 70. Oh, for real? So us, us 11 are like real close. Yeah. And then when we join a unit, we're just like busy mates now. So when we get sent to Afghanistan, no one's really thinking, I'm going to fight for my country kind of thing. Mm. You're just going to do your job um, with your buddies and that's it. When, when, you're, when you're there in the middle of a firefight, no one's, if, even if someone gets injured, you're not sat there thinking, I did it for my country. <laughs> you're just kind of injured, just shitting yourself kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? So that, that's kind of all it is. I mean, I, I get what you're saying because even I had a thought when the whole Black Lives Matter thing reached here in the UK a couple of months back. Yeah. And I thought, in a way, why did I fight for this country when you got the idiot government running it and they don't seem to care anyway? But the thing is, I mean, this is my home. This is all I've ever known. I was born here. Uh, my mum my and dad were born here. 
their parents born in Jamaica, but I, this is all I've ever known. So if I'm going to fight for someone, it's it's not going to be Jamaica. It's going to be Great Britain. Definitely. Um, this is where I raise my kids. This is where I get my food shopping. This is where I was educated. Um, I think the educational system, that's the problem because it we have like a Black History Month, which I just think it annoys me a bit because I think it's like a, we've taken like a, a just a crap deal, if you know what I mean? Yeah. If you just spoke about history, you have no other option but to mention black people, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. But it's the educational system just teaches you what they want it to teach you. So we, we've kind of been given this Black History Month as if, oh, thank you, thank you for mentioning, having us, giving us a month out of 12 months. It's almost like going to your own thing with it. It's not like we're not going to partake in it and implement yeah. it into like our system. Yeah. Here, take this month and do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, and then after that, then go back to where you come from kind of thing and we're going to go, you know, so we almost like taking like a bad deal. Like, if you just spoke about history, it's like, I can't remember the guy's name, but you know, like Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb. Oh, yeah. White guy. Mm. But I can't remember the guy's name, but a black guy actually invented the carbon filament, yeah, which we still yeah, use today. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the full story, but mm. you only get to talk about Thomas Edison yeah. kind of thing, who's the white dude who did that. So it's little silly things like that. We can't teach all history, right? You never leave school. But mm. at the same time, if you just spoke about the whole picture in general, you've got no other, other option but to mention black people, Indian people, whatever, different cultures and everything else like that. When when the bombs were going off in World War II, for example, there were black firefighters putting out the bombs that had landed here in the country and so on. Um, and they won awards and medals and things like that as well. So everyone was involved. Sikhs were fighting alongside us as well. But you don't get taught about those things just because our education doesn't teach you about it. So even though we're a valid part of this country, and we've always fought for this country, being black or white or this or that. No one's really taught about that. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, it was all white, obviously. But we've had a big part to play in the development of this country, um, good or bad. And I think that's why, even though um, we're a minority, I still wanted to fight. And it would have obviously been for this country. Um, and that's why you actually get quite a few black people in the forces. Ultimately, it's a job. But also, if you're going to fight for someone, it's going to be your own, isn't it? And this is okay. this is my country, whether I like it or not. Yeah, I think that's what being one of the failures of um, the, the country in order to get people to be more patriotic and feel more part of the country as a whole. And that that comes down to number one, ex acceptance of like our role within the history of the country, and then also acknowledging it by bringing it in, into the school systems. Because for a long period of time, I didn't even have a clue that there was Blacks. I mean, during my whole secondary school period, um, like, I didn't have a clue there was Black people involved in the World War. I thought we were in Africa somewhere, or we were, I mean, we were just like, just hiding, working in homes and slaves and, yeah. and whatnot. I didn't actually know the impact that we had. I didn't know the impact that the Sikhs had. And that's yeah. a failure. Because if you want people to be patriotic, you have to acknowledge that their part played in a system built. And once you do that and you take full accountability and you acknowledge them and you implement it into the system and, and let them know that the roles that they, they the positive roles in particular, yeah. not just all the negative sides, then you will probably have more people be more patriotic about it because they feel a part of what they see around them. They feel like they, they played a part in building it instead of yeah. just having um, the, the, the owners of those individuals being praised. And it, it kind of creates like a weird vibe for most British, non sort of like no, most non-black British people. Yeah. Because when I speak to most of my friends, they, they don't tend to feel patriotic. They, they tend to have a weird vibe about it. And me, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of connected to three countries, but I feel I'm quite patriotic to all three because I was born in Ghana. I was raised in Sweden. I've got a Swedish passport still, but I've lived, yeah. I've lived in the um, UK for the last 20 years. So in my passport, it says born in Ghana, Swedish citizen, yeah. but UK ambassador. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it says in my Swedish passport. So I'm affiliated to three countries and I feel as connected to all three countries as, as mm. much as so that I like to claim Ghana most because that's my homeland and that's where I was born, but also for a level of like allegiance to all three. And maybe yeah. that's for me having like a more positive um, experience across those three countries overall, but some people yeah. haven't. And some people yeah. are not able to like truly delve into their experiences and be able to get rid of like the bitter end of the side that they feel. So yeah. it's, 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 it's difficult, but definitely inclusion, acceptance and acknowledgement plays a big part in having people become well, a well, Yeah, that's it. I mean, like, like you say, we, we have our own Black History Month. It shouldn't be like that. It should just be the history of the country kind of thing, because then you include it. But by giving your own separate thing, it makes you feel segregated. You, you are different. Mm. We know we look different. We have different you know, more pigment in our skin and the next person has less or whatever. But when you have like, you know, you can have your own history. We don't need our own history. We're just a part of the history of the country anyway. Yeah. So it's kind of like, we're supposed to be as one, 
and be patriotic for the whole country, but we're also being treated differently. Um, whether that's a racial thing, being pulled up by the police or racial profile, but also just being looked at as you have your own history, then we'll have ours and all this kind of stuff. It's a bit silly because, I mean, the thing with patriotism now, it's like back then in, in the day, it was fighting for your country. So let's say 300 years ago, all white men fought for their country and blah, blah, blah. Then when it was mixed, being patriotic was everyone got stuck in and did their bit. Mm. You know, women were building bombs and men were out there shooting them kind of thing, you know. Mm. And then, you know, now I suppose you can say in the same way, it's not just fighting physically for your country, but it's also working, supporting your nation where you live, you know, paying your taxes and things like that, helping out the NHS and, you know, even just cleaning up after yourself. Um, you know, if you love this country so much, bloody pick up your mess. Do you know what I mean? Don't litter and things like that. But unfortunately, people think being patriotic is, let's say, if you're white, for example, mm. and then you've got a black divide, people now get out a Union Jack flag and think that's being patriotic. They hang out their window, the back of their cars. Mm. When Black Lives Matter came, all of a sudden they walk around England, T-shirts on, yeah. and they think that's being patriotic. Do you know what I mean? Um, someone moaned about the <clears throat> Rule Britannia song. So then our country, like idiots, made it number one. Yeah. <laughs> as, as if to say, like, everyone black hated that song when no one's even heard of it, really. Yeah, I and know. That, people think yeah. that's being patriotic. Mm. So sitting on a sofa like a vegetable all day, mm. just chilling out, doing nothing for your country, and then downloading the tune on iTunes for 99p, buying a Union Jack flag on Amazon for a quid. Yeah. People think that's patriotic. So then they're, they've done nothing for their country. <clears throat> and yet you've got lots of black people, like you say, Sikhs fighting wars and so on and so forth, um, building up this country too. Yeah. and yet somehow we're still looked at as a whole separate thing yeah. and that comes from the government down and then the, the government allow the media to keep portraying that out there to the public mm -hmm. and that's why if you get if I now said as a black man I think white people should be slaves the way the media portray it is all black people think the same thing yeah so then all of a yeah. sudden everyone thinks blanket, all black like, yeah. yeah everyone black thinks the same now also it's a big white versus black when in reality it might be just be my own views do you know what I mean so I think that's what's happening. Like there's, there's a divide there, but the media, they've made it have a lot wider over the past six months than what it needed to be. Yeah. Um, yeah not everyone cares about statues. Not everyone cares about this bloody song. Yeah. Not everyone cares. People are just busy living their own lives, believe it or not. And Most they have definitely. been for years. Most definitely. And it's just, you know, it's a joke really, but. Yeah. I think blanket statements are like probably the weirdest thing that's been happening in the last six months in regards to like this whole polarization because every time some weirdo who's sitting in his mum's basement makes a comment on Twitter, everyone accepts it as that's what he's he that's what his racial group believes in. That's what all of them believe yeah. in. And that's yeah. what it's all about, and that's what it all stands for. And I'm like, have you ever thought about it and thinking all these trolls that we're taking serious, turning into headlines and serious discussions? These are these are like minority, tiny group of individuals. <laughs> the majority of society are really just trying to survive. We're all really yeah. in survival mode, just trying to go about our day-to-day -day lives. We're not right. out here continuously trying to perpetuate a system or do this or do that. Yes, yeah. there are governments and there are bigger structures that maybe do need to look be looked into and maybe do need to be restructured. But as the individuals within a country, most people are really just trying to get about their business. And one thing I realized as well with the polarization is that what if if you're gonna if you're gonna create a movement and you really wanted to take momentum for on, on a positive note, you, I think the best way to go about it is by finding a unified message. So, for instance, let's say I feel that the country is institutionally racist. Why don't I fight on behalf of that flag to say on behalf of everything that Britain wants to stand for, on behalf of everything that Britain says that it is in regards to like wanting to be. Um, at the forefront of, of um, equality and fairness and all of that, I'm going to fight for this flag to make it what it's supposed to be. Not to say I'm going to grab this, completely destroy it and build something completely new. I don't, I don't yeah. know how that looks like. I don't know how that's going to pan out. I don't know who's going to lead that movement and whose manifesto yeah. we're going to go by. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. There's too many fragmented manifestos. Yeah. People have got their ideas of what the right way of building a nation is, but... Do the rest of us agree with your with your ideas and plans? I might not, like another yeah. couple million people might not, but if you'll fight for a common purpose and make that common purpose something that most people agree on, it, it would it, it would have a better momentum. But having these polarized views and ideas is causing more divide and you can see well, that's it. what I mean. It's the government doing it because and the media, they want it to happen. So let's say they get me and you on TV all day long talking about it, common sense. But instead they'll have yeah. some idiot dude talking about it why is he getting the airtime mm. 
And that's what happens. You know, they put someone on TV who's go, I reckon that black people should go back to where they came from. But why is he on TV? Because that ain't what all white people think. Mm. But they're the ones getting all the airtime. And then people are going, oh, OK. And that's what happens. It's a bit like the black people at the protest, for example. Some black people think that the right thing to do is kind of get all angry and violence because they think that's the right thing to do because someone's kind of saying do that. But in reality, that's not the way forward because the problem that you got is, we, let's say we knock on number 10's door. Mm. If they just answer it, we'd have a conversation, but they know we're out there. They refuse to answer. So eventually you start bashing on the door mm. and then they react for us bashing on the door, if that makes sense. So mm. when people are kind of angry in the streets and so on, it's not they've just woken up Monday morning and got out there and gone crazy. It's because when no one's listened to what you're saying for years and years and years and time and time and time, at some point it's going to blow up. Mm. And that's what happens. And then surprise boys, that's all over the media. People don't think that this whole anger has just come off the back of nothing. When actually it's been years and years of these stories of, of just being put down kind of thing yeah. and it's flared up but again you know there is a way to move forward it's just trying to figure out what that way is but I think what's more important is it's also the government being interested in working with us there's no point in us having all the solutions and yet Boris keeps his door shut because <laughs> yeah. we get nowhere and I think that's the problem it's how much do they want to help us and support us because by the looks of things when you've got one black person say they hate the Rule Britannia song and you've got Boris trying to jeer the nation on to sing it out loud in the streets like an idiot <laughs> yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. You know, and exactly. he's supposed to be our leader. That really don't help. Because then people think, oh, what black people... I had some idiot on Twitter, some woman, say, I've never had an issue with black people before. I've never seen colour, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But now after these movements, I'm not sure what I think about black people anymore. As if like... Well, black people, it's yeah. yeah, it's just like... And now her mind might look at just me walking down the street with my kids thinking, oh, look at that black guy. For what? Mm. But that, that's what, we haven't created that because not everyone's been, um, take football, for example. Mm. There's 30,000 Liverpool supporters, let's say. Mm. Out of 30,000, you might have 10 who carry a knife, mm. 50 who are there to fight. Do you call the whole entire establishment football hooligans? No, mm. it's just a handful of people who have been idiots. Mm. But yet when you get Black Lives Matter, you've got millions of people involved in it. You get 20 people, let's say, mm. have extremist views and the government, try and make everyone believe that, oh, the movement's a terrorist organisation, they're this, they're that. Mm. So now you're almost a bit ashamed to have any kind of BLM kind of logo on yeah, or say it because yeah. they're trying to tarnish you and make you make everyone believe that if you're a Black Lives Matter movement supporter, mm. you're a this, this and a this. So you're now almost trying to think of different ways to support it and call it a different thing yeah. to justify you. When in reality, all you're saying is Black Lives Matter too. That's yeah. it. And yet somehow by a simple little thing, Black Lives Matter too, you've, you've now got the government trying to make everyone believe that you're this and you're that. It's a joke. Yeah. Um, but that again, that's what they've done. And now we're having to try and fight back. Yeah, so I, I think ma mainstream media has definitely failed us. And it's been very clear right now in the last couple of months that mainstream media have failed us. When I, when I look into mainstream media at the moment, I see that they're in, they're in a battle with independent media. Because independent media, like for instance, me and you having like a... A, a calm discussion about things. We're, we're trying to look at things from a broader perspective and trying to properly discuss it in a calm manner. But so mainstream media is fighting against almost like the, the truth in independent media. So they, they, they resort into all these clickbaity stuff. They yeah. resort into all these polarized stuff, things that will get people to, to read their articles, things that will get people to click and watch their stupid videos because they, yeah. they need to get attention now. And human beings naturally, we're, we're we're biologically evolved to look at the negative because we're always trying to problem solve. So it's like the yeah. negative is more attractive because if someone is speaking truth here or speaking sense, it's like, okay, they've solved the issue. I don't need to yeah. focus on that. Move on. But, <laughs> but if, if we're with us two right now screaming and shouting at each other and I'm calling you all sorts of words and stuff, then my attention goes towards it. It's like, oh, there's a problem there. I need to solve this or I need to be aware of it so I can potentially protect myself. So on an evolutionary level, I see where mainstream media are coming from because they're fighting a losing battle. So now they resort into all these weird false news and, and stuff yeah. that's having more detrimental effect. But uh, I see on one end, they're getting all the eyes on them, the attention. But if you go into a lot of the comments sections, you realize that people are kind of clocking onto their game. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But even if people are clocking onto their game, because they're reaching such a widespread audience, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of people that they're manipulating. <laughs> yeah, like, like they're, they're, they're always 10 steps ahead kind of thing because yeah. they've got that platform. So the real message reaches people, but a lot longer after it's already gone out there. So we're always yeah. playing catch up. It's a bit like in Leeds, there was a survey in Leeds I saw the other day. Only 6% of people in Leeds, 6%, and it's a very diverse area Leeds, mm. cared about statues being pulled down or whatever. 
six percent so that means no one really cares <laughs> you see so but that's not front page saying i don't think anyone actually could how many black people you see walking past these statues with a tear running down their face, crying yeah, about it? No one. I didn't even have a clue half of these people. Yeah, no one knows who they are. Anyone else. Yeah. Exactly, no one knows who they are. All you ever see is people sat beneath them eating food, yeah. just, as a, just as a pedestal, just resting there. Yeah. No one even cares. But the government, again, tried to make it as if everyone black was running around ripping these statues down when it was actually one statue. You got all these patriotic people then come out there in their, in their uniform or ex-military, stood outside the statues in the local town, well, no one even cares. <laughs> it's just like, but that's the thing, but that message gets out there before our message does, which says no one cares. So by the time we've had this conversation, it's been put out there for everyone to see. Their message of everyone hates the statue, it's been out there for three or four weeks. Yeah. They've gained yeah. more followers, more haters, more people who are racist. Some people aren't racist, but they think they're being patriotic by protecting these statues. Depending when in reality, I don't care about it anyway. So, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and that's the problem that you got. They're, they're the message that they're getting out there is wrong and they're beating us to it every time because we haven't got that platform. So yeah. by the time, if this went viral, it's three weeks after they've told yeah, everyone yeah, that yeah. we're a bunch of idiots, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and that's the way it works. We're always playing catch up. That's why we need, not necessarily black people to be higher up in society, mm. but just someone who's not an idiot. Yeah. Um, and that way they can, I mean, imagine if in parliament now, the government are planning on doing this, this and this. Mm. I mean, like, like with the whole feed the kids thing, the, the, those school meals. Yeah, the, the, if the, someone the, like me yeah. and you was in there, we'd be like, hang on a minute, guys. I suggest we give them meals. Mm. You know, the P MPs get 25, 30 pound a day for yeah. food and they're on 100 grand a year. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I'll be I'll be arguing that side of things. I won't just let it slide. But the thing is, everyone in that in that group of people, they're all the same idiots. Mm. So when someone says everyone agrees, everyone goes, yeah, 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 happy days and off they go. And then you've got to spend eight, God knows how long, fighting for the right thing to happen. And it's always the case. The right thing will happen in the future, but it's going to take a long time. Yeah, it is. But I think it is, it's happening because obviously going back again to technology and like independent media is, is picking up. There's more people doing it. There's more people having discussions outside of the, the, the realm of those individuals who are, who are quicker and um, more connected. So I think eventually it will reach a stage whereby the first place you tune into is might not be maybe... Um, the, the morning news or the afternoon news from wherever out there, but it might be individuals like ourselves who are having these proper discussions yeah. and then people are engaging with it and be like, okay, hold on, yeah, let's think about it like this before we go out there and rip it down or before we go out there and fight those who are trying to rip it down in the name of patriotism when really and truly we're now uh, inciting some level of like I I internal war or like race war or whatever. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's a really strange place that we're in, but the media is playing a part and I guess it's all for the, the eyes and stuff, but We'll get there. I think I think there's something bright at hand because right now, if you see what's happening in Nigeria and all across the world and in Africa, people are really engaging and are really pushing the message of... Yeah, but what, why is that, though? It's, it's not on the news, is it, really? It's not really in the front page of the paper. It's your social media. Mm. So that's the thing. Like The government, they could say, right, this isn't right. Everyone listen to what's going on in Nigeria. But no, they're not really interested. Yeah. So the only way... This is the thing, like, social media is good. It's powerful. But it's almost like us versus um, the media itself, like the papers, if you know what I mean, because the papers could put that front page easy, but instead they'll put some stupid front page um, line about death tolls or whatever, or whatever, you know, they'll have some celebrity walking into a shop instead. <laughs> yeah. And yet, and yet we've got to find out that people are being killed or mm. children going hungry or whatever through someone posting a thing on Instagram. Yeah. So it does blow up as big as it needs to get. Cause obviously I found out through social media but why aren't the government posting that? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that, that's, that's kind of, I think, what's sad. But if, if for now we've got to kind of go through social media and do things like this in our own way yeah. to kind of get out there, then so be it. But it shouldn't really be this way. Yeah. But it is. I think, I think the change of guard is very important because we're, right now in Nigeria, for instance, like, um, they, well, in Africa in general, I think a lot of the leaderships are, like, out of touch. So they're, they're out of touch with a new generation, they're out of touch with a new way of thinking. And also this new generation is very empathetic. Like there's, there's a high level of empathy. So everything <laughs> everyone cries about, it. Every, yeah, yeah. everything everyone kind of rushing to conclusions that you're, we're supposed to be able to solve this. We, we, we can, to an extent, a lot of things we can solve. But um, I think, yeah, definitely a new age of leadership is, is required in, in certain um, governments and places yeah. of rulership. And that's one of the major things that's being fought for in Nigeria because the leadership is out of touch. 
The leadership yeah. don't know what's going on on the ground. They're denying everything that's happening on the ground. <laughs> I mean, they did not. I, I watched. So DJ Switch was the um, the person who really blew it out because she was out there protesting. She was she was filming the peaceful protest when they were singing the national anthem. She had it on um, Instagram Live, and we saw on Instagram Live people getting shot. We saw the limbs hanging off of people. We saw people with bullets in their necks on Instagram Live. And then the government comes out and be like, oh, the only person that was killed was a soldier by the protesters. And the rest is just false and misinformation being sold by um, people on social media. So I'm thinking, unless these protests have been out there with the most high-tech Hollywood um, um, visual yeah. effects tools, then yeah. what we saw on Instagram Live, which wasn't pre-recorded, Instagram Live is all like a big, massive Hollywood scene. And it's, yeah. it's crazy to be that out of touch to believe that you're able to lie to the public and lie to the British government. Because I think they send a message to the British government saying um, there's no deaths, they've visited all the hospitals, there was no deaths reported. But I think what needs to happen is that they, the old guard just needs to go. Like the, the old leadership of people being out of touch and not, not understanding the new way of thinking and the youth in general, it, it needs to be looked into. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's it. I mean, the world's a different place now, but we're still running it with old leaders, if that makes sense. Mm. So, you know, there's there's no point. I mean, now you get like gender neutral and all that kind of stuff. Mm. But there's no point having someone running the country who only believes in male and female, let's say, because then those people also have a hard time. Um, it's almost everyone needs to be, the, the leaders need to be a bit more open-minded, I suppose, as to the world that we actually live in today, or else it just, it doesn't work. You know, what they're doing old school, they can shut people up and say, oh, it's all wrong, don't believe what you're hearing. But we've all got phones now, we've all got social media, takes two seconds to send a picture or video, Instagram live. Mm. So yeah, we, we kind of, I mean, and this is the thing, I'm, when I said this a couple of years ago, I was with my friend about it, just saying, why does the world seem such a scary place now? It didn't when I was a kid, I'm sure there was like nothing going on, <laughs> yeah. but it's because you didn't have a phone like that, or you had a Nokia yeah, 3310, so you yeah. couldn't see Jack shit anywhere on the phone. Mm. But that's kind of what, like now you can see things and you can get it just in a second. These things have been going on for years, like, you know, like stoning people to death and this and that. It's not anything new. It's just now we have access to it. So mm. now we have access to it and everyone can see it as it's always blown up on your Instagram or your Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Yeah. Um, we all share it for a couple of days and it kind of dies down again. Yeah. But Something new pops up, yeah. Yeah, and then, but the thing is, because every day there's something new going on. So, you know, today it might be, the, and there's a lot of things today about the kids going hungry and stuff, but mm. next week it will be something else. Yeah, um, even if an alien came here, I don't think anyone would actually care. Like, there's just <laughs> no. so much stuff going this is on. Not 2020. <laughs> yeah, you'd just be like, oh, all right, sweet, and just carry uh, on with the day kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just, there's too much going on. And I think we've got to solve all of these things, but it's going to take time. We've got to figure out what's right to solve first, obviously. But yeah. whilst trying to fight racism in the UK and everyone's being shot up in Nigeria, kids yeah. going hungry at the same time, yeah. you know, everyone's on lockdown. Uh, you know, the government have been lying about numbers, apparently, um, which is obviously helping create lockdown. And with lockdown, there's all these new laws that are going to come into place where you wouldn't be able to brush your teeth without typing in some passcode or some crap like that. Yeah. It's just, it's all getting a bit crazy. And it's just kind of, in the end, it's either we go out there and fight everything or you almost just look after your family, if you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's just trying to, it's trying to, at the minute, I'm just looking after my family for now. That's where it starts. That's, that's, that's where it starts. Yeah, it's too much going on. Because, I mean, if you, if you look at it statistically, we're actually living in the safest and the best times ever, historically. Yeah. As a whole, yeah. But, but then we're also being like traumatized by the speed of news, as you mentioned, like social yeah. media. We're getting the information straight away, so we know what's going on. Because even so, I, I spoke to a lady recently on my podcast about the um, Rwandan genocide in what was it, ninety four? But um, yeah, like million million people getting butchered with machetes in the space of like ninety days, and ninety four. I never heard about that. And imagine a million people getting butchered in today's day, like the, the impact that that would have, how people would just completely lose it and the, the level of distress that we'll all be under. And that's what we're feeling now. It's, it's not that the world is getting worse. It's just that we're having access to things that are happening because there's so many interactions happening in this world. There's like 9 billion of us coming to yeah. 10 billion possibly. So there's so many interactions happening and it, it, it's, it's almost traumatizing that we're getting all this information so quick and it's storing in our yeah. brain. Oh my gosh, a kid got shot here. Oh, someone got choked to death over here. Someone is starving over there. It's like, it's, it's a lot. The thing is, we it's like, we're, we're not meant to, our brains aren't meant to take all of this in. Yeah. If I go to war, you're not meant to be able to see someone get shot or get their limbs blown off. Mm. It's just a dude who's at the war zone. Mm. But you can now get access to it sat at home kind of thing. 
Yeah. You know, you're not meant to see someone getting strangled to death in the street in broad daylight. So you get people who mentally um, aren't as strong as the next person, but still have access to the same traumatic kind of thing. Yeah. So it's almost like, unless you stay off social media, don't watch the news, you have no other option but to take and think. I mean, a lot of people just like to live life, walk down the street, go shop, whatever, and yeah. just have a jolly kind of thing. But in today's time, whether you like it or not, you've got all this negative stuff being pumped into your head mm. and not everyone can process it. That's why during lockdowns, some people have killed themselves with anxiety and so on because they can't take staying in, which is one thing, and just the news saying death, 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 then black lives matter, black versus whites, and then the war zone, it's too much. Mm. And that's just too much to kind of take in. Um, I'm quite strong mentally. And even some things, I'm just a bit like, right, what am I going to do in this situation? How, what's my role to play? Because yeah. there's only so much we can all take on before everyone just gets stressed out. Yeah. And that's the thing. There's just so, there's, obviously, like you say, like nine, 10 billion of us on the planet. And each country has its own dramas. And nine times out of 10, it's bad dramas. Mm. And we've got our own stuff going on here, but we're worried about Nigeria. We're worried about this. We're worried about the Russians or here that, you know, nuclear war and all this kind of stuff. Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever. It's almost too much to take in. On top of that, I've got to take my son nursery. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's yeah. just like... You and I'm still to... sure you're getting treatment for your... Yeah, your, your yeah. It's, just, it's, almost, it's almost too much. Yeah. Um, and then on top of all of this, I've got a three-year-old who don't know nothing about anything. Yeah. He's just trying to live life. And I'm just thinking, what have I brought you into? Because <laughs> it's just... At, at, by the time he's five, he'd experience... He might notice he's different skin colour or hair or someone might have said something. And from that age up until you die, mm. there's just drama, isn't there? There's only a couple of years you can live, really, where you wake up and every day is just an absolute blast. Mm. And he's in that zone at the minute. And it's just sad because things will change. He doesn't know anything about COVID. He's just going nursery, having a good time, running around and having yeah, a good laugh. Yeah. But yeah, the world at the minute, man, it's just... I thought Afghanistan was bad and that was my only thing I had to deal with. But mm. you're dealing with everything now. Everything. Well, yeah. Lots back to the subject of Afghanistan, actually. So the, the Marines, where, where are they ranked in terms of like army and, and the different levels of like units in army? Where, where are the Royal Marines? Then? Well, there is no real ranking system because everyone would think they're the best. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I, I mean, I'm hearing that the Marines, the, in terms of the training to get into the Marines, is one of the most rigorous, isn't it? It's like, yeah. So it's like the hardest, basically. Yeah. Um, if you look at the army side, they have the paratroopers. Mm. And theirs is kind of similar, you could say, or to a degree. Mm. So you get like Royal Marines and paratroopers, and then you get like the army, mm. um, just in general. Um, but obviously, if you're in the army, you'd say you're better than the Marines and whatever. And if you're in the Marines, you'd say you're better than them. So, but officially, our training is like the longest, hardest training you can do. Mm. So that's why there's not very many of us. So, um, yeah, if you have a green lid, basically, with a commando badge anyway, mm. it means you've gone through the hardest kind of stuff. So there is that prestigious name to it. And that's why I joined the Royal Marines rather than just, not saying the army is nothing, but yeah. rather than just join the army, I, I wanted to be um, a Royal Marine. It's, a bit, it's like playing football. You can play for like your local kind of team where you want to play for like Premier League team. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You're in the Premier League, so you've got to work harder for it. But, you know, the rewards are, are great when you're there. So, is, is that is the rigorous nature of the training due to the type of missions that you're involved in? Like, are they, are they quite specific? Yeah. I mean, it's like, for example, in the Falklands, um, you got a thing called a 30 mile in training after like yomp across Dartmoor 30 miles and it's like that in any weather condition with weight on and stuff. Yeah. And in the Falklands, they kind of yomped 30 miles just to have a fight. <laughs> so, yeah. so 30 miles might not sound far, but it is actually quite far, especially when it's like this and you've got your boots on or your kit on all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, you're mentally, physically preparing for these kind of things. Um, no matter what weather condition it is, you still have to fight. You can't be in Afghanistan, it's really hot or really cold, so everyone has a break. Yeah, you just fight so you kind of when you go for training it's 32 weeks long and if it's too hot or too cold it doesn't mean it gets cancelled you're out there just freezing to death or you're getting burnt burnt alive kind of thing so yeah. it just means when you go to a war zone we can get sent anywhere in any any condition and we're kind of ready to rock and roll um at the time when i was there it was afghanistan and even then when i was in afghanistan it was actually quite cold when i was there was it? sometimes absolutely freezing so yeah i mean and this is why now i'm not in the marines you know, I feel like I can, I mean, like it's raining here now, but if yeah. I wanted to go out yomping or whatever for an hour, it wouldn't deter me at all. Like the rain wouldn't stop me or the blazing heat wouldn't stop me. Yeah. Um, just because I've got that mentality where nothing's going to 
stop me doing what I want to do. So yeah. that kind of helped. Um, and that I think that's what's helped me in my life since my injury as well. Most definitely, I can imagine that. What, what, what sort of missions were you involved in though, prior to um, your incident? Like, what were some um, of the um, standout missions that you were involved in? Like some of the crazy well, stuff? Well, I can't really go into it too much, but just, just like the, the general ones, you, you kind of go out and patrol. It's not like, um, depending on where you are, you know, you see on TV, like um, on the news, you know, the guys are walking around this, the, the market and you know, they're kind of high-fiving the kid and all that. Yeah. <laughs> that happens some some places, but not where we were. Oh, okay. um, it wasn't like that where we were kind of thing. Like it was just a, like you were fighting or you weren't fighting kind of thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, like, you know, most of the buildings have been bombed out from the wars before and all that kind of stuff because we're not the only country who've gone to war against Afghanistan. The Russians were there years ago as well. Yeah. And there's not a lot going on until you're fighting. So you're either fighting or you're not. Nothing really stood out like that because every fight's the same. You get into a fight, they're trying to shoot you, you're trying to shoot them, I suppose. And you're just trying to get killed. Um, if you survive it, you're like, bloody hell, I got through that one. And then obviously the next day or the next day after that, you're doing it again. Right. And this is why war's obviously really dangerous because you're not just shooting. You've got landmines, IEDs, things that you can't even see. And you've got to spend six months every day going out there, hoping that that patch of ground there hasn't got a big bomb underneath it. Yeah. Um, and there's no way of knowing until obviously you step in it and it blows up. So, yeah, what happened to me could happen to the next person, the next person on a daily basis. It's just, there's a mine right there, but you, without knowing, you were two yards to the right of it. Yeah. So if, if, if I was two yards to the right or to the left, I would never have known that was there. And it might still be there today. You know, a dog walks over it or something like that. So... Yeah, the, the, the missions were, some were kind of, I suppose, sneaky beaky, but most of it was just open kind of patrolling and, and fighting. You could kind of see what you were doing. Yeah, it's interesting when you watch the movies and, and how the kind of the war in Afghanistan was kind of portrayed. And as, as you said, you, you got you got the troops. And you know, most movies, it's always the Americans going out there and always the American yeah, yeah. heroes of every yeah. battle there is. <laughs> and um, yeah, they're out there shaking hands with the kids. And then there's always like, a, a woman um, covered up and she's hiding a bomb or something and yeah. stuff like that. And it, yeah, it kind of without just bringing a cup of tea or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of glamorizes it and, and puts it in sort of like a weird lens. But I know on the ground it must have been like horrific, like being out there directly and involved in the. I mean, yeah, I, I suppose. I suppose it can't, it's the thing, like back then, could they afford to show the reality of war on the news? No, because mentally you wouldn't handle it. But obviously now they probably could because everyone's gone through so much anyway. We're just sharing everything anyway. So, I mean, it's like even when I was going through training, for example, you weren't allowed mobile phones and things like that. But now you are. People are taking selfies with their helmets on and things like this. And it's just like, you can, everyone's a part of the journey. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if you had your mobile phone out there in Afghanistan and you're ringing home kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you're probably on Instagram yeah. now. You'll be Instagram famous if you're out there live tweeting the yeah. world. Or yeah. <laughs> Snapchat live or Instagram live and like running down the road or something like that. But mm. it's all a bit weird. But I mean, yeah, back then, I mean, the future wars now, they probably won't even involve many people. You'd have drones going off and whatever else. And if it really come down to it, there'll be just a nuke war and then they'll all be dead anyway. So yeah. the whole kind of foot soldier thing, I think it's more of a show than anything else. Because mm. you go out there on patrols and then if anything, you just get an air, a, a jet to come and bomb the area or whatever. The last thing you want is for yourself to die. It's kind of like you're like the final option. It's not like earlier in the war back in the day, let's say, where, I mean, you know, like World War II when you got D-Day landings, you've got mm -hmm. thousands of men just running off, getting shot, running off, getting shot, running off. Like that would never happen now. Yeah. If one guy dies, it's 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 as bad as 10,000 people dying, but it's obviously like really bad if one person dies, whereas back in those wars, dead bodies everywhere, you're stepping over them and all this kind of stuff. You wouldn't get that now. Yeah, I think it's more strategic now, more calculated, isn't it? So we're, yeah, because we just live off technology, don't we? So yeah, was it was it a lot of how, how many lives were lost that day in Afghanistan? Um, I can't remember. I think at one point when I was still when the war was still on, if you know what I mean, and you watch it on the news, I think it was something like three hundred odd people have been killed. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, when someone gets killed, unless they're shot, if you get blown up by a bomb, let's say, it's going to hurt more than one of you. So maybe one person gets killed. Mm. and there might be two or three others injured so each time you hear like a death let's say a landmine blast IED mm. each death there's probably two or three of me oh okay yeah you are living now with no limbs or whatever mm. so you get the death toll and then you get maybe thousands of amputees and mm. so on and then you get people who have seen people get injured who have the PTSD mm. so there's 
thousands and thousands of injuries. Do you know what I mean? Even though only one person got killed, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think and that, that's kind of the sad thing about it. Yeah, and I think the PTSD is along with the physical injury, guys, is, is all as, as bad as each other because I... I saw an article um, a couple of months back in regards to a ex-soldier who was running around with a, um, I, think, I don't think it was a real gun, but he was holding like a, a rifle or something and he got shot yeah. by police because he was going through stuff and he hadn't been adequately like looked into or, or cared for. So I think sometimes like the, the long-term care is also essential for soldiers coming out. Even if you think they're fine, some, they might not necessarily be fine as you might know from some of your colleagues yeah. as well. So yeah, it's I essential. I mean, that's the thing, right. With your mental health, you just your mind creates your version of reality. It's the world that you live in. So if if I put this t-shirt on now and and, and I feel oh, my mind says I don't look right in this t-shirt, mm. if you say I oh, know you look fine, it don't matter what you're saying. It just yeah. matters what my mind is telling me. Yeah. So I've got to go and change it now. And that's the problem. Like once your mind, if and when it says right, I'm going to go through this zone here and think about things, smell things, or whatever. Once it's made that decision it almost don't matter what anyone else is saying, it has to go through it. And you better hope that at the end of it, you're kind of okay. I remember one, I, years ago, I can't remember how, it got to be about like four years ago. And I don't even recall this. Mm. Um, I, I, was always, I was already feeling a bit, a bit just like, mm. and then the next day I woke up at my parents' house. I was on the sofa and my shoulder was hurting. I was like, cause I don't live at my parents' house. So I was like, how comes I'm not at home? <laughs> and during, during the night, at some point, I was acting a bit weird, my mistress said. And I then thought I had to, like, protect the family and get weapons together and things like that. Yeah. And apparently I flew down a flight of stairs and just bounced up as if nothing even happened. And that's where I must have hurt my shoulder. And I was going a bit crazy, apparently. And then an ambulance came. I think the police came. And I was... I think my parents convinced them, because my girlfriend and my parents, and my parents convinced them to just let me stay at theirs. Mm. And I, they were going to take me in. And I just woke up on the sofa, like... Why well, I'm not at home. This is my ceiling kind of thing when I open my eyes, you know what I mean? And again, that had nothing to do with me. That was my mind. Yeah. yeah. And then once it had gone through that and it, it just disappeared, that's it. Yeah. So I've got, I, I can't tell you anything more about it. It just happened. And that, that's the thing. Like, you don't know when these things are going to happen. happen. Yeah. When they do happen, you don't know how you're going to react to it. Um, by the time you, by the time you've calmed down, you've been shot by the police kind of thing, you're dead. So, yeah. I mean, you, sometimes, yeah, it's just, it's really not you. It's just, your mind's just taken over. Mm. I mean, how many times, like, if I say I want to, if I said to you, you know, go for a run this evening, like 10 miles, mm. your body might feel like, yeah, but your mind might think no, and then your gut's a bit, mm, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it's hard to get everything together to come together and say, let's do this. And I think mentally, sometimes your mind is so powerful that it overrides everything. So even if deep down you know what you're doing or what you're thinking isn't right, you can't stop it, if you know what I mean? Yeah. It just takes over fully. And then you're in a zone and that's why it's annoying because I feel fine now, but I don't know if at any point my mind's gonna flare up something yeah. that happened 13 years ago whilst I'm walking a dog, if you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've not got, I've got no control over that. Wow. So I'm just living life now the best I can until the next thing happens, if anything. Most definitely. And uh, I mean, as, as you said, the, the army has given you the strength of mind to be able to cope with a lot as well, even though you're, you're going through a lot and it's kind of conflicting. But um, you, you, you were able to run the marathon, was it the year after, um, was it just after, year after your surgery, right? Yeah, it was a year after my injury, yeah. yeah. So, uh, what, what, what time did you do that in? I'm not trying to uh, compare, well, compare it to my time. time. I run a marathon as well. <laughs> no, well, you know what? It was weird. It took me six hours, 21 minutes. But the thing was, it's only supposed to take me about four and a half hours. So yeah. when I got to like around 12 or 30 miles, yeah. I've only just received a picture of it actually a couple of days ago, but I thought I was getting cramped. So I was running a bit odd, mm. um, but I'd actually fractured my my stump. So oh, is, is when that I got to where, like, where the, yeah, where it's been chopped with? off, because all the pounding yeah. um, just fractured it. So my friend thought it might be cramped. So he's like, there's a picture of him rubbing my calf mm. and the other guy's holding my shoulder because I'm obviously bent over kind of thing thinking, oh, I've got cramp, the pain must be something, because I've got me so much pain anyway. Mm. Um, I didn't know what was what. So after the first 12, 13 miles, the next half of the marathon just took me all day, basically. So I could have run it in about probably four and a half hours. Yeah. But by the time I'd finished it, it was six hours, 20 minutes. But to be fair, I didn't do any training or anything like that. Well, um, no, I just turned up and just ran. So a year earlier, I'd have my leg blown off. So I was happy with it anyway. 
How were you able to do? What, was you was you still fit from the army then? Is that, is that what carried you through? Uh, yeah, there must have been some like core fitness still there. Yeah. Um, and also just my mentality as well at the time. Just, I mean, like I say before, I've always looked at my ability opposed to my disability. So you might have seen me on my blue badge thing. Have you seen that? What's yeah. going on? Yeah. But again, it's just I could just sit back now, being disabled, and just sit here and be disabled. Or I can say, right, I am officially disabled, but if I can walk to the shop, I'll walk to the shop. I could get a wheelchair, but do I really need one? I can walk. No, I'll walk. And if I really need one, I'll then get one on 50, 60. Do you know what I mean? So that's my mindset. So at the time, if I think I can run, I'll run. If I if I think I can do something, I'll, I'll do it. I've always looked at what... I mean, years ago when I was a kid, I broke my leg just before I joined the Marines. Mm. And once I could do press-ups, pull-ups again, because I couldn't walk, that's what I was doing instead. Yeah. As soon as I could walk again, I would then walk again. So I've always had the mentality just to keep moving forward. Yeah. And that's why when I decided to win the marathon, um, unless I collapsed and died, not a lot was, was going to stop me. It could take me all day, but I was still going to finish it, in my mind, anyway. Yeah, and the marathon is hard, man. I've done it in 2013. It is, it? Yeah, I've done it in... Well, you, you would have probably beat my time had you not had gone through your incident, because I've done it in five hours and 15 minutes. But there's a reason for that. I would I would have done it in four as well. Me with the excuses. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what's happened here? Yeah? So I, I got to about where was it? I think it was like around embankment. So that's probably like 23 miles. Yeah, it wasn't too mm. far off. And I had about another half an hour, and I would have done it in four hours or something. So my, I could hear my sisters. They were in like the far right hand corner, um, but you had to run up a little hill for me to go and like hug them and stuff. So I, this was the first time I changed the trajectory of my 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 running. And so I run up there, I run up this hill full speed, went to hug them and everything. And this was, like, I think, the second time only that I'd stopped doing the marathon. Yeah. I was like hugging them, hugging them, whatever. And then on my way down back from the hill, I pulled a hammy. No joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is no excuse. <laughs> and, and I know about hammies because I play Sunday league football. We pull hammies every day because we don't stretch. We don't do anything in Sunday yeah. league. <laughs> So coming down this hill, I was like, no, don't tell me I just pulled a hammy and I've only got like two or three miles left here. So I stumbled my way all the way through. There's a picture of me on running the marathon, which looks like I was crying, but I wasn't crying. I was just in pain. <laughs> I was like holding my chest, like in agony, just hobbling, hobbling through. But I managed to do it in like five hours and 15 minutes or something like that. That's then, good though. Yes, yeah, so for you- People because, don't realise how far it is, do they? Sorry? People don't realise how far it is. People don't realise how- it when, is when you start wrong. running and all that, you get yeah. tired, you get a bit cramped, all that, and it's so much further again. Yeah. So, it never, it but I mean, end. and I think I went through so many like delirious periods. There was a time where like I was screaming and shout, I was singing them. Um, I think I was singing Adele or Emily Sunday or something because mm. I had my headphones in and I was listening to music for a period of time. I was I was running with one of my boys, and um, I was losing it. And then there was a time as well when I reached Jamaica Road, um, and they had a steel band playing. Mm. And I stopped for a minute. I was dancing and doing all sorts. <laughs> 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 and there was a time of lit, like a couple of people passing passing out in and around us and yeah. my, my friend decided that we should be heroes and try and help. help and all of this stuff and yeah there's a lot that happens during the marathon people throwing yeah. up and stuff. people don't realise how long and rigorous and painful it is mentally and physically so that's people, the thing but at the end of it when you get a little medal and you're smiling like that everyone thinks yeah. oh yeah it's Bob point out next year they know we're <laughs> right. they don't realise what you've gone through to get there it's just yeah. for the picture, you just go like that. <laughs> yeah. And you're struggling with that picture because your whole body's shaking. Yeah. I was like this. Yeah. And I was like, hurry up and take the picture. And as soon as I took it, I was on the floor, like, yeah. I'm taking it for a banana. Like. Yeah. And then cramped for the next six weeks. It's just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's good. I mean, I think I'm glad I've done it to experience that. I mean, I've run further than that before anyway, when I was mm. in the Marines, but it's a whole different type of thing. But the whole atmosphere, the experience, whether they, you can do it again, I've done over it after, after COVID and all that. But mm. it was. Um, it's something you'll never forget. We well, got runners running up and down the road and all that, but they're not running 26, 30 miles, whatever. Do you know what I mean? But I think it is the whole thing is good. Obviously, raising money, it's an, a good experience. And at least you know you can push yourself to that distance. Because, like I say, mentally, it's a massive thing. As soon as you get a bit of cramp, you get out of breath, yeah. your mind just thinks, stop. Mm. And then by the time it thinks that, you might be seven or eight miles in. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, that's the thing. It's a long way to then keep going. So, yeah, it just shows that, you know, if you finish it, you've got that mental toughness there. It's true. And then, and then you're raising funds as well. So I was, I was raising funds mm. for a, um, a Catholic organisation that I was helping out at the time. So they, they called the Prisoners Advice and Care Trust. So they help reform prisoners back into society. I've been in there for yeah. long periods of time. And it, it's like, I had this big, massive top on that says like Prisoners Advice and Care Trust. And it's like, you don't want to let the people down as well that you're, you're working for. Yeah, that you're, yeah exactly. You're yeah. fundraising for as well, but you're out there dying. But it's an amazing feeling. And I could probably see myself doing it one more time again down the line, but... The training process for me was long. It was like eight months. 
Yeah, but I, I was kind oh, of at the time. Was playing, I was playing a lot of football at the time, but it took me eight months to really get in tune to get it done. But yeah, yeah, it was it was hard. It was That's hard. the thing. I mean, I'm glad I didn't train to be honest, because I would have probably just given up if I'd have started training that long. I just I just turned up and just ran. But I mean, if, if I'd have trained, I was going to say properly. If I'd have trained at all, mm. I probably would have been in a bit better shape, stretched properly. I didn't even do no stretches. Just turned up and just, just rocked up I, and just. Don't yeah, know. just yeah, just ran, just basically ran like an idiot. I ate a load of bar- <laughs> chocolate bars at the start, like a fool. Um, next about yeah. eight, I was in a celebrity tent without heroes, so yeah, it was like Katie Price was there, Peter Andre was there. Well, they had lots of free Snickers bars, Mars bars, Lucas Aid because yeah. it was all free, and I didn't get anything free. I just yeah. drank and ate as much stuff as I could. <laughs> Were you giving out the jelly and babies then, as well? Doing the whole yeah, thing? yeah. And then <laughs> start boom. As soon as I started <laughs> running, I was like, <laughs> so. But yeah, it was um. It's good. I'll never forget it. It's good. I'm glad I've done it. And as I say, I mean, I've always said I'll do one more because I've done two. Mm. Um, but I've, I don't know if I will now. Now my age is out of 33, and I've done no fitness. Like, I do yomping and stuff, but I've not put myself like that. And if I really did hurt myself, yeah, it takes me way long yeah. to recover as well. Mm. You still look fit though. Like, is it, are you working out stuff? No, I mean the thing because it takes. Apparently, I don't know if it's official, but they say I use like 56 percent more energy just to walk around with my limbs and stuff. So even if I had a bit of a bad lifestyle, I still couldn't get out of shape anyway. Yeah. Because I'm always, just to walk down the flight of stairs, back up the stairs to the shop, no. down there. Because I, I, I live an everyday life like everyone else. It's just, I'm working harder just to get down the road kind of thing. So I don't have to stay in shape to be in shape, if you know what I mean? Yeah. Unless I literally just sat there all day, which I don't. So I'm quite lucky in that sense. But yeah, I don't do any exercise. Well, workout. I just if I walk on the malls for like a couple of hours, that's about as far as I go. No, I don't run any more than that. To be honest. I hear that. Um, before you go, just a quick question. So I saw I saw a picture of you with um and Prince Harry. Is he, is he a homie? What, what's the relationship there? Yeah, you know we're actually quite close years ago. Um, yeah. when obviously lived here, had his number and stuff. We'd meet up, go for drinks and things like that. He'd send me like beer and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, when I got um, had surgery and then I had um, MRSA, I think afterwards, something like that. Yeah. I was quite sick, and he sent me like crates of beer down and little cards. No way. Um, had to travel McDonald's, send me like cards and stuff as well. So at the time, <laughs> yeah. it was all pretty cool. But the thing is, back then, again, it all goes over your head because I was busy focusing on getting my limbs sorted out and trying to move forward. So I suppose you don't really get to appreciate what was going on. It's only when it all dies down. I look back and it bloody hell, I was there, me, my mum, my dad. Yeah. Rooftop bar with Prince Harry, Joss Stone, all having beers together, getting drunk and all that. My yeah. uncle was there. But at the time, I'm just taking it on the chin, just doing it. And yeah, the next day I'm with David Hay or some, some celebrity bash, whatever. Yeah. Met Sylvester Stallone as well. Oh, I see. And that was cool. Now, now I look back, I think, actually, I've met, I remember the Royal Family. And that was quite a big thing. Mm. Um, I'm glad I got some pictures and things like that. But he, he was sound. I mean, he's just like a normal guy. But yeah. the problem is obviously now, because he's met Megan and gone, the whole country just trying to tarnish him and yeah. Megan, and they're yeah. the worst people known to man. You got paedophiles in the royal family, for God's yeah. sake, and yet yeah. we're all trying to ruin this guy here just because he moved over to America. So, I mean, it's, it's sad, really, but he's a nice guy. Um, yeah, but again, unless you kind of leave people, you leave the media, then. Yeah. Even before the debacle, he's always been, I always felt like if I was going to meet any of them and have a good conversation with them, be able to chew him, it was definitely going to be him. He seems like he'd be <laughs> yeah. one of the lads, like easily. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's it. The, the one, the one member who would relate to the public more than anyone. Yeah, that we're all slagging him off. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Don't make any sense. Yeah, but what sort of stuff do you got coming up? And tell, tell us, tell the audience and my listeners something. Some of your businesses and some of the works that you got coming up. And obviously, I'm gonna put all yeah, your so handles, social handles, in the descriptions as well. And let them know where to get in touch. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, to be honest, I've got Instagram and Facebook, but I've not been on those for years because mm. when I um was going through my phase mm. um, of just like, dep- I'm not yet yeah, depression or PTSD, whatever you want to call it. Mm. I just came up everything. Mm. Um, I, 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 that's what I said. I suffered really badly with anxiety at one point and panic attacks yeah. to a degree where I couldn't even unlock my phone because you know my fingers would go like that and I couldn't lift my arm and things like that. And oh. I just came off all social platforms. So I've been off them for four or five years now, but I have them. Um, but here's the thing, like the only reason I got back on Twitter was because of the Black Lives Matter thing. Yeah. Because what was happening was I was sick and tired of people. One black person says something and everyone jumps on the whole black community. Mm-hmm. And it enraged me that much that I actually came back onto social media just to post, like, you know, stop kind of hounding black folk because it's not everyone. And, and that, that's the reason why I'm back on social media. Or else we'd never have met kind of thing. Yeah. Um, 
but it was only out of frustration because there's only so much you can take before you've got to say something back. And, and that's kind of what I did. Because obviously after the, the death, you know, in America, I couldn't even eat properly for a couple of days because I was that wound up with the reaction of people to that death and us kind of saying that's not right, you know? So yeah, I have social media, but I, to be honest, I'm not really a massive fan of it. I'd only sucked into it again like I used to be. Years ago, I was doing selfies in the lift with my clothes on, tagging the brand, <laughs> all the saints and all that. <laughs> I was giving it the big one, trying to get 53 likes and stuff. <laughs> but um, I've kind of come off all that anymore. So yeah, I'm not big on social media, just Twitter now, because I suppose it's a bit more adult-like and I don't think I get sucked into little spats as much as what I used to. Um, but, you know, work-wise, I mean... I can't even leave the house, really. <laughs> so I think we're on the verge of going back into tier three. So, um, so yeah, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, not a lot. It's, it's <laughs> weird because for the first time ever, I can't actually say what the hell is going to go on. Um, for the public moment, speaking right? wise, I'm not plan. public speaking. I can just go on Zoom um, and just kind of have these conversations with people. So that's kind of what I've been doing at the minute. Business wise, um, again, not a lot going on because mm. the last thing I had was a restaurant that collapsed anyway. Mm. Um, and then obviously I'm glad that I didn't have anything else live at the time because that would probably be dead right now anyway because COVID's killed everything. And then the stress of furlough and then staff and mm. my own issues anyway. So yeah, I'm kind of, everything that I've got is just tied to me. Yeah. And that's why I feel kind of a bit grateful because COVID's not affecting me too much because all of my assets, everything that I have is just here, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I've not got nothing out there that I'm thinking, oh no, what if the government don't? Everything's just me. Mm. And all the things that I, I mean, I had a speech that I was going to do in front of, let's say, 500 people in London a couple of weeks back, but I did it on Zoom. Yeah. So I can still operate, if you know what I mean. So I feel quite lucky like that. But yeah, I mean, future plans is just look after my family because I don't know what the hell's going on right now. <laughs> um, when, when we can go traveling again properly, I don't want to be the first person to jump on a plane. And then I'm gonna hold off and see what happens to the first the first batch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm gonna let me the guinea pigs first, and then see yeah, what yeah. goes on. I mean, it's like it's weird because the pub's opened, and then you got people just rush into the pub straight away to get a pint. I'm happy just to buy a can of beer from the shop and just drink yeah. it at home. Do you know what I mean? Like what I've been yeah. here for the last six months. So yeah, I'm gonna be. If it was just me, single, I'd have been the first down the pub and whatever else. But I got a family now, and I can't be the fool who goes to the pub or jumps on that flight or goes to that hotel for no real reason because mm. I'll catch it, sp spread it to my family, they'll all die and I'll survive knowing my luck. So I'm not going to put them in that situation. So yeah, I'm just going to chill. Um, I'll just be tweeting still yeah. my views and hopefully get more than six likes and one retweet here and there because <laughs> that's that's the usual sketch. <laughs> but um, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm staying positive. COVID's not killed everything for me. Um, and I don't think it won't kill everyone for everyone else either. And I just think we'll get through it. And, you know, in two years' time, I reckon we'll look back and the world will be a better place. Um, it'll be cleaner anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that's what I'm hoping for as well. I mean, we, we can definitely see the, the changes in the environment is, have, is, is happening. Mm. In terms of like the cleaner the air and um, less, less congestion and so forth. But, yeah, I'm hoping as well that we come out of a, a better world and we, we realise how, how lucky we are. You know what I mean? And yeah. We, we take a great lesson out of this, that we've survived and and there's a better way of looking at the world. And I think what's happened as well is that without the distraction, we we're able to assess the world in a, in, a, in, a, in a better way. We're able to actually see some of the flaws within our various systems and so forth. So yeah. hopefully the momentum does continue and people do make progressive and, and ruin proper change. And we don't just go back to the norm. Because one thing I always say is that I feel like humans, we're, we're creatures of amnesia. Like it, it, we forget that a thousand years ago uh, something crazy happened or we forget that just under 100 years ago there was like a world war like we, we forget that there, there was a holocaust there was slavery there, it's like sometimes we're creatures of amnesia and we kind of go back into our, our normal ways but hopefully we're yeah. able to elevate from this and we're able to pick out the lessons and, and move on and make create a better world for our children and the next generation well, that's it. i mean and that's why i think we should have these conversations and get them out there because i think most of us are on the same page yeah. I think the same way. It's just, unfortunately, the ones who make the wrong decisions, they're the ones who are seem to be running the country and whatever else. But yeah. I think overall, you know, I mean, it's like, take furlough, for example, how lucky are we really to have furlough anyway? Mm. You know, we are being helped out and we moan at the government, but a hundred years ago, we all just die out. <laughs> and then whoever's, whoever's yeah. left is, is left. <laughs> that, that's I mean, it. That's, food, that's what it was about. It's like yeah. survival of the fittest. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, whoever was left was left and that's it. So... We've come a long way, and this is, 
I think it's just because of the world we live in, the fact we're in a pandemic anyway is a shock for a lot of people. Mm. Um, because you just think that can't happen in 2020, but clearly it can. Um, but we'll find a way to to battle it. We've got science and technology and we're looking in that sense. And and I'll say off the back of it, I don't think we'll go backwards, we'll only just we'll only move forward. Mm. Um we used to make sure it stays that way. But that being said, we've then still got battles to fight and it's yeah. just a lot going on, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. Ben, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, man. It's been really insightful. Yeah, thank you. You're, you're truly inspirational, man, because I don't think there's anyone that can, there's nothing there's a lot of people that can go through what you've been through and still maintain the same level of like um, optimism and, and, and positive energy and, and fight to continue going on. And I, I wish nothing but the best. You know what? Yeah. The thing is, people say, oh, you know, yeah, it's great and all that. But the reality of it is, like, we're all in the same boat here. Like, everyone's going through something. It's all relative. So you've got two options. You kind of jump out a window and end it all. Or if you choose to live life, you may as well make the most of it. So mm. I've chosen to live. So I'll get out of bed and I'll yeah. kind of live life. Do you know what I mean? That's it. Definitely. And it's just the basics, isn't it? And I think if you res respect and appreciate the basics of life, then just make the most of it. Because obviously, look what's happening now with, with covid Mm. it's not just the elderly dying it's the young generation as well so i'm just going to live life and just get on with it until yeah. i'm dead and that's it so nothing inspirational about that it's just if everyone thinks in that way you just kind of you've got the option but to get on things you know especially when you've got kids and stuff just move forward so i think that's that's what i've always said you know just get on with it think about what you can do and just get on with it yeah. you know you only live once as i say I mean, one thing settled down, we'll definitely catch up and have a beer or something, man. Yeah. Mate, put, it's a shame we can't do it now, isn't it? But I know. It's way just... things have worked out, but yeah, it's, but I mean, the thing is, we still got to connect, so that's yeah. the main thing. Definitely. We're going to catch up again and definitely have another conversation. I really enjoyed this, actually. It's been super insightful for me as well, man. Hopefully. Well, it's been a first for me, so um, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that, Ben. But what have you got planned for the rest of your day? Uh, my son's having his first haircut this afternoon. Oh, for real? Because obviously, because wow. of lockdown, he's three years old now. Yeah. Um, and the barber's been open, but again, I don't want to go rushing straight down there. Everyone's been yeah. sat there and everything. So he's having it done at home. But he's he's got, his hair's quite bushy when it's dry. Yeah. A bit out of control. But when it's got moisturising or like, it's not too bad, but still it's getting a little bit long. So he'll have his first little chop today. That's about it, really. Is he excited? Is he looking forward to it? He doesn't know what's coming yet. <laughs> we told him, but he's just like, oh, okay. But when, when he's sick... Uh, whether it happened, like different story, because when he sits in the chair, yeah. he might just kick off. But hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed, he'll have his haircut today. We'll see. <laughs> well, you pre warning before he just goes mad and be like, what the hell's going on? Yeah, yeah. I'm swinging it, <laughs> just mop it all up. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, uh, cool. I'm, I'm, I've got another recording shortly, and then um, I, I'm just going to try and rest today. I feel like I've, I've, it's been a hectic week, so I'm going to take some time out, chill out, and possibly catch up with the boys later on. And, uh,